Hello everyone, my name is Javier Moreno and this is my presentation on atypical antipsychotics and the nervous system. The nervous system is made up of the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. In this presentation, I will focus on the CNS, or more specifically the brain, and medications used to treat mental disorders. Mental disorders such as schizophrenia and their pharmacological treatments are important to discuss, although a heavy stigma exists against mental disorders. Antipsychotics and mental health in general are fairly new and poorly understood, but here's what we know so far. The therapeutic class of drugs I will be discussing are antipsychotics. These drugs were once called major tranquilizers. They are also called neuroleptics as they are associated with neurological adverse effects. All antipsychotics are essentially dopamine antagonists that are used to treat disorders that involve thought processes. Antipsychotics are indicated for schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders such as hyperactivity, combative behavior, and bipolar disorder. The primary action of antipsychotics is a change in neuron stimulation. There are two types of antipsychotics, typical and atypical antipsychotics. The pharmacological drug class for antipsychotics are dopamine antagonists. Dopamine antagonists are dopamine receptor blockers which help normalize the amount of dopamine in the brain. Many of the typical antipsychotics are further classified into the drug class known as phenothiazines. Atypicals, on the other hand, vary in terms of pharmacological agents, including D3 antagonists, D4 antagonists, M1 and M4 muscarinic agonists, NK3 antagonists, and other neurotransmitters. In terms of pregnancy category, this medication is graded a C. Um, as we will see, blocking dopamine receptors comes with its notorious stigmatized adverse effects. According to Coughlin et al., there are significant associations between antipsychotic exposure during pregnancy and an increased risk of mul multiple adverse obstetric and neonatal outcomes related to congenital malformations, fetal growth, and preterm delivery. According to our Karch textbook, antipsychotics cross the placenta and enter the breast milk as well. As I mentioned, there are two types of antipsychotics, typical and atypical antipsychotics. So the typical antipsychotics are the older ones. They block dopamine receptors and they have more adverse effects. Eight, um, atypical antipsychotics, on the other hand, are the newer antipsychotics, and they block dopamine and serotonin receptors primarily, but as we will see, they also block other neurotransmitters. These atypical antipsychotics have less adverse effects. Typical antipsychotics include Thorazine, Haldol, and atypical antipsychotics include Abilify, Geodon, and Seroquel. So just how did antipsychotics come about? Well, in 1891, Paul Ehrlich observed methylene blue. Methylene blue became known as a phenothiazine, which led to the development of phenothiazines for their antihistamine properties. A phenothiazine, chlorpromazine, was eventually given as an anesthetic to surgical patients, and then it was extended to psychotic patients. This is how the first antipsychotic chloropromazine or thorazine was discovered in 1951. In terms of atypical antipsychotics, clozapine was the first and it was discovered in 1958. Atypical antipsychotics are the antipsychotics that I will be focusing on. These work by blocking the D2 and 5-HT 2A receptors. I will be discussing these antipsychotics as these have less adverse effects. These are indicated for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and other psychotic disorders. The goals of treatment are basically symptomatic. These antipsychotics are not to cure but to treat the symptoms that these mental disorders manifest in. As far as pharmacokinetics, these medications are available by mouth, sublingual, or intramuscular. These medications are often stored in tissues for up to six months, and they are metabolized in the liver and excreted in bile and urine. 
Antipsychotics are used to treat schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, the most common type of psychosis, affects 7 or 8 people out of every 1,000. So this is about less than 1% of the population. And it usually appears in late adolescence and early adulthood. Schizophrenia, although not very common, is a very debilitating disorder in which the cause is not well understood. Scientists, however, propose that it may be caused by genes, the environment, or a different brain chemistry and structure. Scientists believe there's an imbalance of interrelated chemical reactions in the brain involving dopamine and glutamate. At first, it was believed that hyperactive dopamine transmission results in schizophrenic symptoms, but according to other studies, there is a hyperactive dopamine transmission in the mesolimbic areas and a hypoactive dopamine transmission in the prefrontal cortex in schizophrenic patients. Also, some people with schizophrenia have been found to have larger ventricles in the brain as well as, well as more gray matter than the general population. In terms of genes, there is a higher chance of having schizophrenia if there is a first-degree relative or a second-degree relative that has the condition. Also, in terms of genes, there is no single gene that causes a disease. Rather, there are higher rates of genetic mutations in people with schizophrenia. It prevents people from functioning in society due to positive and negative symptoms, as well as cognitive symptoms that consume the individual. As I mentioned, schizophrenia is a disorder involving dopamine, and antipsychotics work by blocking dopamine. So, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is part of the catecholamine family, like adrenaline. Dopamine alterations in the brain lead to symptoms of schizophrenia. Positive symptoms are symptoms that are not generally seen in healthy people. These include hallucinations, delusions, thought disorders, and movement disorders. Hallucinations are sensory experiences that occur without a sensory stimulus. Delusions, including delusions of persecution, are false beliefs that persist even when there is evidence that the belief is not true. A movement disorder that can occur is catatonia, in which the person is motionless and does not speak. Negative symptoms are thought to be caused by a reduced D1 receptor activation in the prefrontal cortex and decreased activity of the nucleus caudatus. Symptoms include flat effect, reduced pleasure in everyday life or anhedonia, difficulty beginning or sustaining activities. Cognitive symptoms include poor executive functioning, trouble paying attention, and problems with working memory. Typical antipsychotics are effective in reducing positive symptoms of schizophrenia, whereas atypical antipsychotics are effective at reducing both positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Atypical antipsychotics have been found to increase acetylcholine and dopamine release in the prefrontal cortex of lab rats. According to Meltzer 2004, these two effects might be important for the ability of atypical antipsychotic drugs to improve the cognition in schizophrenia, as both dopamine and acetylcholine have been shown to be involved in memory and learning. Other indications for antipsychotics include bipolar 1 disorder, schizoaffective disorder, and major depressive disorder. Bipolar 1 disorder is a mental disorder in which the individual experiences manic and depressive symptoms. Schizoaffective disorder is basically schizophrenia and bipolar 1 disorder combined. So the individual experiences schizophrenic symptoms and symptoms of mania and depression. Bipolar 1 disorder again involves two extremes, depression and mania. Manic symptoms include flight of ideas, hyperactivity, euphoria, grandiosity, hypersexuality. Depressive symptoms include anhedonia, suicidal ideation, fatigue. The causes of bipolar 1 disorder are inconclusive. Patients with bipolar 1 disorder go through cycles of mania and depression with a few weeks in between or just a few days in between these two extremes. Major depressive disorder is a disorder which involves a constant sense of hopelessness and despair.
Symptoms include sadness, hopelessness, guilt, worthlessness, anhedonia, difficulty socializing, sleeping, and concentrating or making decisions, and suicidal ideation. The causes of major depressive disorder are inconclusive, but it is thought that it is similar to schizophrenia in which there are reactions that are occurring abnormally within the brain. Adverse effects to antipsychotics include CNS effects such as sedation, weakness, tremor, drowsiness, EPS, pseudoparkinsonism, dystonia, akathisia, tardive dyskinesia, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. EPS includes the symptoms such as tardive dyskinesia, Parkinsonism, akathisia, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Dystonia manifests itself as spasms of the tongue, neck, back, or legs. Akathisia includes in continuous restlessness. Pseudoparkinsonism includes muscle tremors, cogwheel rigidity, drooling, shuffling gait. Tardive dyskinesia is an abnormal muscle movement such as lip smacking, tongue darting, and chewing movements. NMS is a potentially irreversible and life-threatening complication, and it usually occurs in the first two weeks of treatment. NMS symptoms include high fever, sweating, unstable blood pressure, stupor, muscular rigidity, and autonomic dysfunction. As I mentioned, atypical antipsychotics have much less instances of these adverse effects. However, on occasion, there are instances of tardive dyskinesia and NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome in atypical antipsychotics. Anticholinergic effects include dry mouth, nasal congestion, flushing, constipation, urinary retention, impotence, glaucoma, blurred vision, and photophobia. Cardiovascular effects include hypotension, orthostatic hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, etc. Respiratory effects include dyspnea and bronchospasm. On a side note, typical antipsychotics such as chlorpromazine or thorazine may cause pink or reddish brown urine. Atypical antipsychotics are especially notorious for causing weight gain and diabetes, so much so that a study aimed to see if the administration of metformin would be effective in limiting the weight gain induced by atypical antipsychotics. However, current evidence is weak. At week 12 of using atypical antipsychotics and metformin, the weight change between the metformin group and the placebo group was not significantly different. As I mentioned, neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a syndrome that is life-threatening and it is an adverse reaction to antipsychotics. It usually occurs in the first two weeks of starting antipsychotics, with 90% of the cases occurring within the first 10 days of therapy. Symptoms include high fever, sweating, unstable blood pressure, stupor, muscular rigidity, and autonomic dysfunction. Autonomic dysfunction includes tachycardia, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and complications of NMS include respiratory failure, rhabdomyolysis, and kidney failure. Tardive dyskinesia is another adverse effect, and this one again involves involuntary movements of the tongue, lips, face, trunk, extremities, and these occur with long-term antipsychotic use. A dysfunction of the dopamine transporter has been thought to play a role in the development of tardive dyskinesia. Newer atypical antipsychotics like olanzapine and risperidone have less risk of tardive dyskinesia. Symptoms include facial grimacing, finger movement, jaw swinging, repetitive chewing, and tongue thrusting. Anti-Parkinsonism drugs, drugs that are frequently given with antipsychotics, do not improve TD. However, decreasing the dose of the antipsychotic may help. Increasing the dose of antipsychotics, on the other hand, may hide TD. Drug, food, herbal reactions to antipsychotic involve medications, alcohol, and CAVA. Medications including beta blockers, drugs that prolong the QT interval, and anticholinergic medications should not be taken with antipsychotics. Alcohol results in CNS depression when given with antipsychotics. CAVA is a herb that has anti-anxiety properties. However,
It is associated with EPS at dosages of 100 to 450 milligrams per day and should not be used with antipsychotics. Cultural considerations for antipsychotics. African Americans respond more quickly to antipsychotics and they have a greater risk for tardive dyskinesia. They should be started at the lowest dose possible and monitored closely. Asians and Arab Americans need lower doses of antipsychotics. Patients from Asian countries like Turkey, China, Japan metabolize antipsychotics quickly and they require lower doses in comparison to Caucasians. On this slide I present adjuncts to antipsychotics. Omega-3 supplements, multivitamins, gluten-free diets, ketogenic diets, and casein-free diets, as well as other adjuncts, improve the mentation of patients with mental disorders. Psychotherapy is also important to consider as far as non-pharmacological treatments. Psychotherapy includes cognitive behavioral therapy, personal therapy, compliance therapy, and family support. Family support is especially important as patients with mental disorders often depend on others for assistance. So the family is important in knowing what the symptoms of mental disorders are and what adverse reactions may occur with medications. Nursing management of schizophrenia includes positive communication and emotional support support, medication, adherence, and recovery goals. And during hallucinations or delusions, the nurse should calmly say that, you, that they see things differently. It is not helpful to say they are wrong or their ideas are imaginary. Things to consider as a nurse as far as assessment include assessing for contraindications, performing a neurological assessment, cardiorespiratory assessment, musculoskeletal assessment, gastrointestinal assessment, integumentary system assessment, and laboratory tests. Contraindications to antipsychotic include CNS depression, circulatory collapse, coronary disease, severe hypotension, bone marrow depression, and prolonged QT interval. As far as a cardiorespiratory assessment, the nurse should assess the patient's respiratory rate as well as orthostatic hypotension. As far as a neurological assessment, it is important to determine the patient's orientation and affect. It is also important to assess their reflexes, their bowel sounds, and their temperature. Laboratory tests that are important include complete blood counts, liver tests, renal tests, and thyroid function tests. Nursing considerations include pathology education, medication education, weight management, diet education, blood levels, safety measures, and comfort measures. It is important that these patients adhere to their medications. Oftentimes, they do not want to take medications, and sometimes it's because of paranoia. It is important to maintain a healthy weight as antipsychotics reduce the life of these individuals by 20 years, especially because of weight gain. A healthy diet is important in also maintaining a proper weight. Blood levels should be checked frequently as some of these antipsychotics may cause bone marrow suppression. These medications might impair one's ability to function with machinery. Thus, safety measures include not operating any machinery while taking these medications. If the patient is hospitalized, it is important to make sure that the side rails are up as these medications may cause orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, and impaired judgment. And here I have the patient educational handout, which you cannot see, but I will post a link to it. Thank you for watching my presentation.